Well, hello, welcome to the FI View with me, Tanvir Gill. My guest today on the show is Mark Tinker, head of AXA Framington Asia at AXA Investment Managers Asia. He joins me all the way from Hong Kong. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for taking out the time to speak with us today. My first question to you is, what does the recent data from the U.S. suggest? Will the Fed move on rates earlier than expected? Uh, or is there still some time to go before the Fed concludes on its timing of tightening? Well, I think the, the quick answer is I think that they will take a little longer to move on it. But I think the, the longer answer really has to be saying it's not about tightening monetary policy on the basis of a strong economic growth. This is really about a decision of when you move away from this ultra low level of interest rates back to a more normal level of interest rates. So the problem you've got at the moment is you've got two completely different markets operating. You've got the real world where people borrow at three or four percent, probably minimum, uh, and that is you know, where credit and the, the normal, what we'd understand of the use of, of Fed funds. But then you've got this sort of extra world, which is where people can borrow for almost nothing. If you're a bank or if you've got ability to repo, sell stuff back to the central bank, you can borrow for almost nothing and buy other financial assets. So we've got this weird situation where the real determinant for the Fed of what they do in terms of the ultra low level of interest rates is to try and limit the amount of damage that is possibly being caused by this financial market, the carry trades and the leverage that's going on in this kind of separate world. So the data coming from the real economy isn't going to be the key decision about when you stop this ultra you know, cheap money experiment. It's going to be when you fear that the actual markets themselves are going to cause damage once again with too much leverage, too much um, sort of spread or carry trades within the markets themselves. And that's the thing they're looking at much more carefully. But how well prepared is the market uh, for potential tightening if that were to come by? Uh, and of course, if it were to come by earlier than expected, that's, uh, you know, in the second quarter of 2015 itself. Well, I think uh, we saw a little bit of this with the so-called taper tantrum last year. What that was about was the Fed saying we're not going to provide this ultra cheap money forever. And so a lot of people moved to take off those leverage carry trades, those bets that they had on, many of which are actually in emerging markets and emerging market debt in particular, which is why we got that big wobble in high yield and emerging markets uh, last summer. Um, I don't think the leverage has gone back in to the emerging markets. I do think there's still quite a lot of uh, leverage in high yield debt. There's a lot of people have been sort of driven into uh, these uh, fixed income markets where the yields have all come down to very, very low levels uh, such that they're very, very expensive. People talk about equities being expensive. It's the bond markets that are expensive and they've got leverage money in them. They've got a lack of liquidity. So that's my main concern is actually when the Fed tightens, when the Fed, Fed effectively stops um, buying back in all these bonds, when those markets revert to normal. So that's the delicate act that they're playing. I don't think we can say this is what happened last time, it'll happen again. I don't think it's as big a problem for emerging markets as you would have thought if you think that's what happened last year. The, the leverage is in a different place. It's much more in uh, developed market, bond markets, rather than emerging markets uh, compared to last year. So there is a risk. Um, and I think they're going to try and let the air out of this bubble. Um, without causing too much damage. They know this, they know what's going on. It's not a surprise. Uh, it's a question of you know, how you do it. But you know, the trade that is of course um, uh, playing out right now in lieu of uh, the expectation of possible rate hikes is the strength in the dollar. Uh, it's come late in the year because uh, many expected the dollar would show strength in the first half, but it seems like the second half is turning out to be more rewarding for the trade. Do you think there's more upside? Again, I think this is a little bit of the unwinding. I think a lot of people had borrowed dollars uh, in order to buy, as, as, as they did last year, uh, you know, emerging market debt and so on. And so when they had to close out those bets, the dollar rallied, then it stabilized. And actually, I think it's normalizing now. I think it's going back more to where it ought to be um, because people aren't borrowing as many dollars to sell dollars to buy overseas currencies as they were previously. So it's a little bit of a normalization to, uh, uh, if you like, a, a more fundamental level as this leverage comes out of the system. The reason the dollar has been weak for the last few years is it's been the funding currency for people to put on all of these leverage carry trades. And when they do it overseas, it makes the dollar weak. Um, and uh, now they're not doing it overseas and they're doing rather less of it generally, I think. So we're just seeing, if you like, the dollar floating back to a level 
closer to where it would otherwise be without all this financial market uh, speculation. So yes, it's a positive for the dollar. Sure. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, sitting out here in India, the sense one gets is that you, you still don't have a handle on whether the growth revival in the U.S. Uh, is more a mirage or a reality. Uh, you know, the first two quarters have played out uh, on account of seasonality, uh, that element. Uh, quarter three, quarter four will perhaps give a better sense of uh, where the long-term growth story stays uh, for the U.S. economy. What is your own expectation on how things will shape up uh, as far as quarter three, quarter four GDP uh, numbers are concerned and also uh, growth into 2015? Well, I, th I think the, uh, the U.S. is on a very stable growth path. I think um, people got a little bit too uh, carried away with the bad Q1 numbers, which are very weather affected apart from anything else. Everybody downgraded and the same people have rushed to upgrade after the very apparently very strong second quarter. So stripping out that noise, I think there is a positive growth story. The U.S. Uh, spent five years deleveraging its balance sheets. It stopped doing that. We're now seeing credit growth. We're seeing underlying income growth. We're seeing, particularly in the service sector, uh, I think that's very important. You've got uh, strong PMIs. You've got strong uh, data coming through there, which is, again, it's all about a normalization after the kind of uh, the final ripple effects of the aftershock of, of the uh, crisis of 2008. So the U.S. is back on a normal track, I would say. And back to your uh, previous questions about the Fed and what that means. Remember, right now, the Fed is not setting monetary policy on the basis of what the U.S. economy is doing. The Fed is setting monetary policy on the basis of how stable the financial markets are. It wants to make sure they can cope. Uh, from their previous trauma, but equally wants to make sure that they don't cause any more damage. So the real focus for short-term interest rates is going to be what the financial markets themselves are doing. The focus for equity investors, for the rest of the world in terms of what is U.S. demand going to be, what's consumption going to be. I think you should factor in positive, normalized 3 to 4 percent GDP growth in the U.S. Um, and a particular focus on the consumer. And don't forget, the big story in America economically for the last five years has been about cheap energy. The shale gas revolution has brought down the cost of energy very significantly and created a lot of reshoring of uh, industrial activity into the U.S. So there's a lot of positive economics going behind all this that if you only looked at the uh, interest rates, you'd think, you know, it must be a mirage. No, the, the growth is real. Uh, the interest rate story has many of its own financial market components. Sure. Uh, what does that mean really for emerging markets? And I'll start off with the currencies first because we touched upon the dollar. Uh, the dollar strength is, of course, putting pressure for EM currencies. Uh, is that going to be broadly the trend going forward? I think, again, um, in the context of let's take the last two years, uh, the American investor almost looks at America and then it has the rest of the world. And the rest of the world is split between Europe and emerging markets. That's kind of how they tend to apportion the buckets. When the American investor, the international investor, got worried about Europe back in 2011 and into 2012, it switched a lot of its assets into emerging markets. Now, that drove up the currencies and the bond markets, they bought these emerging market bonds of all emerging markets, but particular places like India, Indonesia, the higher yielding ones. They switched out of high yielding European bonds like Spain and they switched into India and Indonesia. That pushed the currencies up, pushed the bond markets up, dragged the equity markets up. Now, ironically, when Europe fixed itself, that was bad news for emerging markets because all of that hot money came flooding back the other way. It caused the currencies to go down which then meant people rushed for the exits because they were, you know, in foreign they were losing on the currency, so they rushed out of the bonds. So the emerging markets switched fast up and then fast down. And what that did is left people looking at the fundamentals and talking about the fragile five, you know, the, effectively the, the uh, emerging markets like India, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Turkey, with um, current account deficits. And when you have a current account deficit and you have inflation, the, long-term view is that your currency will depreciate. Short-term, if you have inflation, you have high interest rates, you might get money flowing in, which pushes the currency up. But long-term, you're going to get depreciation. So you should expect the rupee, for example, to depreciate over time because that's the way you balance out the internal and external purchasing power of your currency. So medium-term, you should expect these high-yielding, higher inflation rate currencies to go down, not up. Short term, you get these floods of money come rushing in. 
it pushes the currency up short term and it becomes self-reinforcing for a little bit, but the trend is for depreciation. And that is what you're seeing with the so-called Fragile 5 currencies, is that the currencies are, again, normalizing, which should mean they weaken over time. And that's why the dollar is strengthening over time, because it's, it's all about this normalization. But the last few years, we've had an exaggeration because of the speed of the hot money into merger markets and out again. Right. Uh, specifically for the rupee then, because you touched upon that as well, uh, what does this mean? Because, um, you know, it almost seems like whether it's strength or weakness, we are largely trading in this broad range of between 58 uh, to 62. Yeah. I think, I think what happens is that I would argue that the underlying trend is for weakening, but you, you trade within a range um, and then you gradually which way you, you know, drift up or, or, or drift, drift down in terms of depreciation, drift up in terms of the, the amount of uh, uh, rupee to the dollar. Um, so I would, I would say that your trend is for weakening and at the moment you're, you do trade within that band and what will happen is that you'll get people when it's at the bottom of the band, um, you know, people will sell it when it's at the top of the band, they'll buy it. Um, just, but that's going to be a roundabout noise, that's going to be how people trade off the data, trade off the noise. As an equity investor, principally, I need to look through that and I need to recognise I have to factor in a depreciating currency into my expected return if I'm going to invest in those markets. And I think that's the sort of the default option for most international investors. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, your broad EM view. Now on the risk side, uh, you know, Argentina default, Russia, Ukraine situation, Middle East tensions. Those are uh, the, uh, the factors which are perhaps, uh, uh, you know, influencing the EM trade right now. Uh, but on the positive side, do you think uh, that uh, you know, these re risk factors are receding because the EM trade has largely become a differentiated trade where it's each country for its own? I think, yeah, there's two, there's two aspects to the EM trade. I think the, the first is uh, whether you're in EM or other equity, and the second is where you, if you are in EM, where you are within it. So one of the things that's certainly been evident here in Asia is that um, with the concerns over Argentina, with the concerns particularly uh, in Central Eastern Europe and the Middle East, a lot of the pot of emerging market money has looked at Asia and said, well, actually, there's far less risk out there, geopolitical risk. Actually, funnily enough, the valuation is pretty attractive, the growth prospects are good and so on. So there's been a, an asset allocation within emerging markets looking at Asia. And I think that has actually triggered, as we've seen what's happened in you know, Hong Kong, China, um, uh, even Japan, uh, that's actually triggered some sort of broader equities to say, well, why do we, can we really ignore these markets like we've kind of managed to for the last few years? So I think it's actually bringing more attention into the better performing emerging markets from people out of developed markets. So there's a bit of a DM into EM switch, but it's into the EM markets that are doing best. Um, and within EM, it's, there's a rotation away from the geopolitical risk towards the, uh, mainly towards Asia. Right. What trends are you picking up in terms of fund flows? Where is incremental money going in within emerging markets? Uh, I'm given to understand that, you know, GEM funds are already uh, overweight. Uh, there's a lot of money that they have allocated, uh, you know, in specific regions over the last three months. But the global funds are still looking uh, to change their allocations. Well, I think a lot of the, uh, what we've seen in the last uh, couple of years is people got very excited about Japan and reforms and there was a panic and that was a big fun flow because people had been underweight. Uh, they then got very excited about China and the reforms uh, last November, uh, but there wasn't such a big fun flow because it, the index weight didn't really uh, make much difference, but there was a bit of excitement and then they got bored. Same people who got very excited about India and Indonesia. Now, of course, Indonesia is you know, a very small market. India is a bigger market. But again, the big institutional investors have not moved into India for all sorts of reasons, but there's been good fund flows, particularly by the ETFs, to chase the whole Modi story. Um, I think what's happening now is that the big international investors are looking at China, even though it's not a big benchmark story. You're getting more and more people saying, we need to understand what's going on there. They're not buying it yet, but in terms of uh, uh, the actual attitude in terms of the research and investment that's going into the area, I'd say that's where most of the big investors are concentrating their attention right now. If not necessary, they're buying. Mm. What's the view on India specifically? It's, is, despite the 22% year-to-date return, is it being viewed as a fairly valued market at this juncture? Is there more to come for this year? 
It's not fairly valued, no. It's, I think it's probably uh, well, at, well up and well ahead uh, of, of events, to be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, yes, we do love the idea of structural reform. Uh, we do like the idea um, that uh, you know, after years things can change. But the market has very much priced this in. I'm not saying it's price or perfection, but it really has run you know, quite excitedly. And there's a lot of expectation. There's expectations from investors. There's expectation from a billion Indians. And uh, you know, Modi has to balance the two. You see with the announcements he's making to try and get support from the farmers. Now, investors would look at that and say, we don't want any more of these subsidies. But there's real politic involved here. So I think investors have had their turn. I think they've got to wait while Mr. Modi deals with some of the other people who have expectations for him to help them. So now I think people are, yeah, it was a great trade for active investors. The other thing I would add is that it is difficult to actually invest in India for large institutions. It's, there are quite, it's quite cumbersome, quite bureaucratic. You need you know, various uh, structures to be, able, to be able to invest. And that was made so by the previous government. So it's not an easy environment to invest in. What are the sectors right now, Mark, which are top of the mind when it comes to investing in India? There's been so much focus on policy-sensitive sectors, power, infrastructure. Um, foreign investment has been opened into defense, railways. Uh, you know, sitting out of Hong Kong, which uh, where is it that you're uh, sizing up opportunity to invest in India right now? Well, I think I think the market has gone for all the policy-related uh, uh, areas, and that's right to have done so. I mean, this is where you can get a material change to the earnings of people that are exposed to it. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's very much in the price of all of these stocks. And the irony is as well, of course, is that one of the reasons people think uh, Modi is going to be great is because as a regional governor, he was able to make things happen. Now he's gone to the center, they're effectively assuming he can do the same thing, but we've got to interact with all the regional ones again. That, that hasn't gone away as one of India's issues about the inability to direct things from the centre because of the power of the region. So you've also got to have lots of mini modis around the regions to, to make things happen as people are hoping it will. So infrastructure is definitely the way to go, but we've already gone there. Uh, and um, you know, these, these stocks in these areas are priced for things to go pretty well. Um, and you know, there's, uh, I think it might be a bit of a, a bumpier ride. So I think along with many international investors, we're, we say, yeah, we'll look there. But I don't think we need to chase it right now. Right. What about monetary policy uh, outlook? Uh, you know, the RBI has reiterated its focus on inflation. Many are calling it uh, uh, enemy number one that India needs to kind of uh, fight and beat. Uh, from that perspective, uh, there is talk about a rate cut not happening in this financial year. That's over the next six to eight months. Uh, how would you view that move in the light of the growth concerns that are there for India? Yes, there's going to be a revival, but 5.5% is what most expect on the street for this year's uh, GDP growth. Well, again, probably a lot of emerging markets, and India included, is, uh, is there are structural reasons why you have uh, high inflation, much of which is to deal with food uh, and energy. Um, and you have all sorts of complications to do with subsidies, you have complications for both food and energy, which, which create problems for the budget. How can you take away those subsidies without causing um, you know, polit great political unrest? It's a problem for Indonesia as well. Um, and monetary policy, people are kind of assume it can fill that gap. Uh, to be honest, tightening or lowering interest rates will not change the structural problems. Well, it changes structural problems that you know you can produce food in the north of India, but you can't actually get it to the to where it needs to be consumed because they haven't got any decent roads, they haven't got the, the right refrigeration, they haven't got the right distribution. That's actually the long-term story that people are excited about: is decent infrastructure in India can make a phenomenal difference to the ability of the economy to generate a return on capital, if you like, to improve the efficiency of the economy. But these are structural reforms, and without those structural reforms, you will not really be able to deal with the embedded inflation problem, um, particularly because of the, the aspect to do with, with food. Um, so it's a, it's a tricky in, interest rates to deal with inflation. It's, it's the wrong tool. Inflation is a structural issue. And so we, we've got much more hope of changing that, but it's not going to be changed overnight. And short term, um, you know, what, what happens is, is that uh, it just affects short term money flows as people chase higher or, higher or lower interest rates. Um, and making sure you don't get a, a leverage boom. You haven't got much of a leverage boom at the moment. That's good. 
um, but interest rates and inflation. Mm. So, Mark, when do you uh, see earnings uh, picking up for India? You know, because that would be the key catalyst for the market to get re-rated from here, you know, to 18, 19, perhaps even 20 times earnings uh, at the peak of, uh, you know, the, uh, of, of the bull market in 2007. We uh, kind of turned course at 22 times forward earnings. So, you know, going down to that level, going up to that level, actually, when do you see uh, earnings kind of justifying those valuations? Well, the, the, We've got, we have got this structural versus cyclical issue. I mean, you can have cyclical earnings growth, which are really largely inflationary, which is really what was going on back in 2007 with quite a credit fueled boom going on, uh, unsustainable levels of demand, which then would all rain back in again. This is different. The market has moved to put the uh, pretty high multiples based on structural improvements and based, based on these, these policy how quickly they come through, they're not going to come through very quickly. So therefore there is a, a gap risk that the market gets disappointed that you're sitting there paying pretty high multiples for things that are still subject to policy risk. Uh, second thing is, uh, always a problem in emerging markets, is actually demand may be great but costs can rise. Um, and if costs rise, then your, your earnings don't follow through. You might have good sales but you don't have good profitability. So there's, there's risks. Uh, from uh, commodity prices, labour, uh, wages going up, which is a good thing as far as politicians are concerned to have higher wages. We've seen it in China. Uh, it's not a good thing as far as profitability is concerned. And you haven't necessarily got the operational gearing coming in that you had back in 2006, 7, where sales, you know, you, you could increase sales without increasing unit costs. So I think, you know, that's why if you look at the return on capital versus the price to book, India is one of the most expensive markets out there. And I don't think the earnings are going to come through very quickly. It still requires a leap of faith uh, to hold on to uh, Indian equities at, at these levels. Final question on India, Mark. Do you think uh, that with improving macros, India could become a good candidate for a potential ratings upgrade 12 to 18 months down the line? Um, and it's important because right now we have the lowest level of investment grades. So, you know, a ratings upgrade would only perhaps increase interest and increase the amount of money that's allocated to the region? Well, what's very important for India is it actually needs to restructure its debts. Uh, a lot of corporates uh, have borrowed in dollars um, and that always presents a risk when you have a ultimately a depreciating currency. There's hope that they can uh, effectively raise equity in order to pay down the debts, uh, which is why you know, people are pushing, the authorities are pushing the, the equity market. Uh, we'd have to see that happen. We'd have to see the equity markets. And remember, this is all international investors. Indians aren't owning their own equity market. So they've got to persuade the international investors to effectively buy their equity in order, them, in order them to rebalance their debt. If they do that, then yes, the rating agencies will approve of that. But the, uh, the important thing is, is that um, you've actually got to get the capital markets to do the restructuring for you. Um, and, and issue equity to swap your debt before you can issue any more debt. Uh, and that is a, a problem for most of these Fragile Five, is that they, uh, they're running current account deficits, uh, they're effectively having to attract international capital, and to do so, uh, they've got to offer value and they've got to offer sensible restructuring, and um, yeah, that's what we need to focus on next. Mark, thanks very much for joining us and Pleasure. giving us your perspective on India and world markets. Really appreciate your views. Uh, with Pleasure. that, we come to the end of this edition of the FIR View. Thanks very much for watching the show.